Um, today's session is categorized under uh, creativity and innovation. The title for the session today is Accessible Games, Virtual Reality, and, and Wearable Devices for People with Vision Impairments. And we're very lucky to have folks from the City College of New York here to present with for us. And um, before we go on to that, I would also like to thank our sponsors, the Computer Center for Visually Impaired People, um, the New York State Commission for the Blind, Rossetti Rossetti and Associates, Hidden City Cafe, and several other uh, individuals and organizations whose generosity makes this conference possible every year. Um, we'll, uh, I think we'll hold off on questions till towards the end. That'll be the most efficient way to do it. Um, but of course, I will leave that to the gentlemen who are presenting. So without further ado, I will start by introducing Dr. Shigeng Xu, who is the uh, Kaser uh, Chair Professor at, uh, at the uh, of Computer Science at the Grove School of Engineering at City College uh, of New York. He is also the Principal Investigator on the EFRI RIM projects that they'll be describing today. EFRI RIM stands for uh, grants that are provided by the National Science Foundation, and EFRI supported projects are. Uh, if I can remember, Emerging Frontiers in Research Innovation. And um, these support uh, the participation of individuals who are traditionally underrepresented in the science, technology, engineering, and um, uh, mathematics fields, um, such as individuals of, of racial and mi uh, ethnic minorities, women, and people with disabilities. So these, and the projects are research uh, experiences and mentoring. So doc, please welcome Dr. Zhu and his associates. Uh, thanks, Don, for the nice introduction. Uh, so the, I'm going to start out with a very brief introduction to our team and uh, project. Uh, so the, all of us belong to the City College Visual Computer Lab. And uh, we are working on a, a large National Science Foundation project, every. So I'm going to get into that a little bit, just in one or two minutes. Uh, so how to go to the next? So the project uh, have uh, include the three labs uh, at the City College in New York. Uh, I'm uh, I, I direct the City College Visual Computing Lab, uh, doing research on sensors, uh, algorithms, and uh, devices. Uh, for both uh, robots and uh, visually impaired people. Uh, this is my lab. The, uh, another lab is uh, the Rose Lab, neuroscience lab, uh, doing research in human perception and uh, action, uh, directed by the Dr. Tony Rowe. At the media lab, uh, working on uh, 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 pattern recognition, face recognition, sign recognition, all this research is, you know, and uh, algorithm development uh, led by Dr. Yingli Tian. So three of us working on the project uh, with the collaborators at the Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, and as well as the uh, industry and the community. So uh, the project uh, is uh, Don said is called EFRI, uh, Engineering Frontier in Research and Innovation. Uh, it is a National Science Foundation pro program. So in that program, there's a topic called Man Machine Motor Control. So our project is all about assistive technology for the visually impaired. Uh, so our research, the goal is to try to improve assistive technology for the visually impaired uh, through the modeling and the learning of human brain. So for doing this, you know, the three of us, three labs uh, mostly, uh, we are doing three major components. The first component, of course, is the development of the algorithms, the devices, and the sensor technologies for helping the visually impaired. So after we having that, so we want to have the second component is to try to understand the sensory and the motor representation of human, human brain particularly, so that we when the when we use the sensors and the technologies for visually impaired people, we want to measure the performance, not just the action, uh, you know, performance, but also uh, monitor the brain activity so that we get a better understanding of, uh, of the human 
perception process. So the uh, the uh, the goal is to try to build a better machine. For example, for robot navigation, we want to learn the model uh, from human brain so that we can get a better mo model. This is a kind of scientific research. Uh, of course, you know, as an application, we also want to develop better assistive technologies, include the devices, algorithms, and uh, also the transitution method, you know, the stimulation method, so that uh, visually uh, impaired people can be benefited from this. So as a research uh, project, uh, we have actually have three goals. The first, uh, as I said, is the research, scientific research. Uh, the second one is the education. Uh, Don already said that uh, we have been running the uh, summer program called the REM, Research Experience at the Mentoring, uh, for three years. This will be the fourth year in the summer. So every summer we recruited uh, uh, about 10, sometimes more than 10 students uh, from uh, different levels. Uh, you know, the uh, have graduate student, undergraduate student, and also a high school student. We also have recruited the high school teachers and the faculty. Uh, how was uh, one of the faculty member in the past uh, two years? Uh, he's going to involve uh, in the program in this year. Uh, those people, you know, most of the participants are from the underrepresented groups, uh, include people with different uh, disabilities, include visual impaired and uh, other learning process challenges. So this is the education part. Uh, finally, you know, of course, we want to make the research education. Not only we do research, find the scientific value, you know, you know, uh, the the, the dis uh, get a scientific discovery. Uh, we train our student, but we also want to do something useful for the community, particularly to help helping the visually impaired people. So for this, today we bring uh, three key researchers, uh, developers in our lab in our project uh, doing uh, 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 three things. The first is the accessibility, accessible games uh, by, by Dr. Hao Tang, uh, who is the assistant professor at uh, the uh, Borough Mahandu Community College uh, at CUNY. Uh, the second one will be wearable devices, uh, will be presented by Mr. Edgardo Molina, uh, who is uh, still a member of our lab. He's graduating this year. Uh, with a PhD, uh, but he is a, a co-founder of Vista Wearable Incorporation with another two students. They are actively working on the small devices that are wearable. And the third part of the research is using virtual reality to train uh, the users and test our methods and algorithms. Uh, the present will be uh, given by Mr. Wang Ku. Uh, who is now a PhD candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, all of us, uh, uh, you know, are, all, all members of our lab, Visual Computer Lab at the City College in New York. So uh, I would like to introduce, uh, you know, Hao Tang. Hao Tang is going to present the uh, accessible games. So the, after his talk, is uh, Ricardo, I think Ricardo, right, is going to present the variable and uh, why give the presentation for virtual reality, okay? So thank you. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. And also, first of all, I would thank the Dan and uh, Professor Chiganju give an introduction. Um, so my topic uh, today is gonna be a accessor, um, exercise game, exercise game for blind using uh, motion sensor. Uh, this is a joint work with the uh, City College uh, Vision Lab and uh, uh, Rose Lab and also um, uh, CMU. Uh, first, I would like to give an introduction about the motivation. So, what is the uh, motivation uh, motivate us to uh, develop and uh, implement the actual game for blind? So, um, as we know, uh, visually impaired uh, always have the limited opportunity to access the uh, physical world. So that means uh, uh, even though now there are so many new assistive technology come out every year, but it's still a big challenge for them to go outside independently. So most of the time, they, they spend uh, most of the time at a home. So, um, but we believe uh, the game might, be, uh, might help uh, people, uh, visually impaired people, to uh, give them more access to the outside world. Um, 
Second, uh, we think to, because the, uh, the entertainment is, is very important for everybody, okay? not only for the regular people, but also for visually impaired, uh, especially they spend so much time at home. And in 2014, um, the game uh, is about $82 billion market. It's compared to the uh, movie, thir uh, $38 billion, and the music, $15 billion, is, um, game market is uh, much bigger. And, but uh, uh, we found uh, there are not many uh, video game, um, accessible games uh, available for visually impaired. So most of them play um, audio game if they are interested in game. And in addition, so uh, we also got some inspiration from um, recent advance in motion sensor. So motion sensor is, uh, uh, the sensors uh, can detect the uh, human body and detect the distance of the object and uh, detect uh, uh, the motion of the moving, um, the motion uh, of the moving body. So, um, they can be used to uh, detect, uh, recognize the gesture. And we believe this kind of device can help, um, it's, this kind of device introduce new way to, for um, human and computer interaction. So we think um, the device motion sensor can be also used benefit um, visually impaired community to help them to uh, interact with the computer. And finally, the, there's a concept called the gamification. It might be a new concept for some of you. And so it actually explains, uh, um, it means the game is not only for entertainment, but also it can be used uh, for other purposes. For example, for education, for training. So my colleague, uh, Waiku, is going to uh, explain uh, more on this topic. So based on the above uh, uh, a few uh, considerations, so we think uh, it's worthwhile to uh, investment time and uh, uh, research on the game, extra game for blind. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce the two, uh, two, uh, two games we developed in uh, past two years. The first game is uh, called uh, um, Rock, Paper, Scissors. That is a small game for, a simple game for visually impaired uh, kids. And the that game used a close range uh, sensor, uh, which measure up to one meter. And, and the other game is for uh, facing a large audience uh, for general visual impaired. And uh, that is called uh, um, uh, find a survival in dark. Uh, in that, uh, that game used a different sensor. It measure a large, relatively longer distance. It's used uh, it's using Microsoft uh, Xbox Kinect sensor. So first I would like to start uh, um, the rock, paper, scissors. So how many of you know uh, rock, paper, scissors game? Okay. Okay, for some of you may not be uh, familiar with the rock, paper, scissors. That is a very popular uh, kids game. And so uh, basically when they play, the kids, uh, two, usually two kids uh, play uh, each other, they simultaneously show um, three, uh, three, one of three gestures, rock, paper, and scissors. There are three uh, gestures using finger, hands. And so basically rock uh, represent in, in the, the top uh, image, uh, it shows the, the sensor, the, the motion sensor we use in that game. And the, the bottom row show a three uh, interface of the, our game. And in the interface, you can find a three gesture and the first one is a uh, uh, rock. It's represented by a uh, hand, uh, a fist. So it's close uh, your hand. That's a rock. And uh, the second one the, in the middle is a uh, paper. Paper is represented by a uh, open hand. So separate finger. And the uh, the rightmost one is uh, the last one is a scissors. It's uh, the uh, close hand with uh, two finger extended. So the, ba the simple, um, the rule of the uh, game is pretty simple. Basically, a uh, rock can, um, can uh, beat the uh, scissors, and, but the scissors can cut the paper, and paper can cover um, rock. Okay. So we use uh, the motion sensor on the top uh, to detect uh, uh, three gestures. 
And so the post recognition has been done in, the, in our game. In addition, uh, we, in order to make the game more uh, accessible, so we want the game can be fully in, uh, controlled by a sensor can, by, by the, without using the um, keyboard and mouse. So we also introduced a new, defined new uh, gesture, uh, which, uh, for example, the thumb up um, represent the start a new game, and we will hand to read the instruction. And we, in the game, we use the audio feedback uh, to give, we, 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 um, for the, we generate the speech uh, synthesis for uh, read instruction and to report a uh, score. And the game, we have a different version, and the one version is a network, uh, the other version is a single player. So I have a, a little de demo I can show you. Uh, There's uh, a little delay with the audio, I think. Ready, set, go. Paper, rock, score, one, zero. Round two. Ready, set, go. Scissors, rock, score, four, one, one. Round three. Ready, set, go. Paper. Scissors. Score. One. Two. Round four. Ready. Set. Go. Scissors. Paper. So in the interface, score, uh, the, two, bit, uh, two. the bottom right uh, left Ready, uh, image set, show the, the user. User show, Rock, keep showing the gesture. And score, on the top, two, that is uh, um, Game over. the three score, gesture. Two, the gesture uh, computer can recognize. On the right hand side, uh, uh, the picture shows uh, compu uh, the gesture uh, PC plays. So, and then the uh, the score um, is show um, beneath the the picture of the the PC uh, recognition. And so the user can um, adjust the speech read and can disable the background music. Okay, so after we developed the game during the summer, and we first test our game in the, our lab uh, with the sighted student, um, blind, blindfolded student, and then we, based on their uh, feedback, we made some improvement, and uh, including uh, user interface, and increase the accuracy of recognition, make it more reliable, and uh, add an instruction. And then we, uh, last year, we visited Visions, uh, which is the vision is the uh, um, well, the organization we were done original work with uh, last year I think, and uh, that is uh, um, the nonprofit organization in local New York and provide a service for visually impaired people, and uh, we visit a training school at Upstate New York and they they host a training school I think for kids, and uh, we test our game um, for more than thirty kids. There are some of a blind, some of a low vision. And uh, we got a, a lot of valuable uh, feedback, but uh, we also found uh, uh, for the younger kids, they are engaging, but for the older kids, after they play once or tw uh, twice, and they lost interest. So in, in addition, we also found there are other limitations. This is a one of the major in, uh, limitations. The logic is, uh, game logic is pretty simple. It's very easy to lose um, interest. And there are other some uh, there are other limitations. For example, the low we use the low uh, close range uh, um, sensor, so only cover the low uh, small field of view. So the user can easily move their hand out of view. So uh, based on this uh, limitation, this feedback, we actually we want to uh, the last year we improve um, we want to design a different game. So that is the second game. So not only facing the um, the, this one facing a larger audience is for general um, uh, visually impaired. So the second game is called uh, uh, Find Survival in Dark. And that is also uh, an extra uh, size game. Uh, the game has multi-level, and uh, the game in interface has a, is a grid-based map. There are three uh, uh, characters. So uh, if I'm the player, I'm the, um, the user. Um, 
the, the first and the major um, player, the character. And uh, my goal is uh, I, uh, in the map, I try to find where is the survival. The survivor uh, is located in a fixed location. And uh, the only cue I used, because I cannot see the map, right? so the only cue I can use is the audio cue, because the, the survival keep calling help. So I try to figure out by the uh, audio cue. And uh, so I move my position uh, in the map, and eventually I found, uh, uh, if I found, uh, until I found a survival, I win the game when I finish the one level. But in the meantime, and uh, in order to make the game more fun, so we introduce an uh, additional character called Zombie. Okay, Zombie is uh, keep uh, coming towards me. Uh, his uh, Zombie tries to beat me, so when the Zombie is close enough, I, try, I need to use a gesture to beat Zombie. So yeah, there, there are three gestures. And the Zombie makes some noise, like the footstep, and uh, so we can figure out uh, and how far and the, where did, what is the direction from the, of the zombie. So basically we try to, this is a, we use the audio cue, we try to um, figure out the location of the zombie and the survival from the audio. So um, that's, the, that's why the, the, um, the audio is very important. So audio feedback is very important. So the more realistic the 3D, the sound generated, the, the easier we can figure out where is the zombie, where is the survivor. So we use a 3D stereo sound generator to generate sound. And in addition, we, in order to make the um, game fully uh, more accessible, we use the uh, voice recognition. Uh, so user can, uh, without it, uh, touching the keyboard and mouse and the of course, we, we had a, a feature let them to play uh, using keyboard, but in addition, they can use the voice to, um, to navigate. For example, uh, if the user want to move forward, they can, um, they can speak uh, forward and backward, uh, right and, and left. So I have a, a small video to try. So this uh, video, uh, the short video, just show the uh, Kinect uh, skeleton tracking, which uh, the, uh, the, um, the technique we use to uh, recognize the, um, the gesture. Remember the, when the zombie is closing to uh, approaching um, myself, I need to use a gesture to beat the zombie, either uh, in the right direction. If a zombie is coming towards, uh, from left, I, I make a mistake. I, I, I wave a hand towards the left, right, so I, I had a problem. So, I, <laughs> so yeah, that is. Uh, so after we finished the uh, uh, implementation, we again we also applied the uh, um, perform the user study. Uh, first, uh, we uh, we test our game in the lab. We got uh, some feedback, and uh, we so uh, somebody uh, so someone think uh, they need uh, some more time, additional time to learn game, so we add a beginner level uh, without zombie, and uh, uh, some, somebody thinks the movement is, zombie's movement too simple, so we, we increase the difficulty of the game. And uh, after that, uh, last year, we had a chance to visit the CCVIP and did, uh, did a demo here, and uh, we also gathered some valuable feedback from um, blind community. So um, then we improved that. Uh, so uh, some of the feedback include the uh, voice recognition doesn't always uh, work properly. So we add the movement uh, confirmation. So um, if in case the recognition is wrong, so at least from the video feedback, I know uh, the PC made a mistake. So I can always adjust. And uh, additional feedback include uh, make a uh, more level and uh, make a um, different weapon. So I don't have to wait the zombie close to me. I can shoot uh, like bullet. So uh, yeah, that's a uh, nice feedback. So overall, so um, during the implementation and development of our game, uh, it's pretty interesting, pretty um, um, exper uh, the, the successful experience. We got so we, we think uh, we also be, we still believe that we our game can um, improve the life, the quality of life of visually impaired and uh, 
help them um, to encourage them to uh, have a more com communication between uh, visually impaired and um, and the sighted people. For example, the first um, game can encourage the, stu um, the kids can play online, and they can more have more uh, interactive uh, with either sighted or blinded kids. And and in addition, so the in terms of the gamification, so the second game can be also used uh, as a pre-journey. Uh, the so pre-journey means uh, if somebody want to go somewhere, if but uh, if I somebody some visually impaired want to go to Penn Station, but they don't know, um, they they are not familiar with the Penn Station. But if we have the map embedded in the game, so they can play uh, the game at home and to make them more familiar with the facility and the structure of the Penn Station, and they somehow we we believe they can have more confidence confident to go outside independently. So um, also the both game are the exercise game, so they encourage them to do the exercise. So the f there are some future work and we can improve, refine the user interface, uh, make it more accessible, and uh, uh, design uh, actor game using regular camera, and the audio um, make it a map, uh, generate, uh, automatically generate a navigable map and use them for pre-journey tasks. And, but and we are still facing a, one of uh, a big problem, which is the need a more uh, visually impaired community. How about to do the experiment? Uh, that's it, thank you. <laughs> so um, I think we're, I'm going to take a, a question at the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Hal. Uh, my name is Edgardo Molina, and um, I am also a PhD student. Uh, my advisor is Dr. Zigang Zhu. Um, uh, but I also have a second role. Uh, last year, we uh, spun out some, some of the research we did, and we founded a company to try to um, commercialize a navigation device that we've created. Um, our company is called Vista Wearable. Um, so, the, the basic technology we're using is vibrotactile feedback. So uh, if you're familiar with cell phones, you can put them in vibration mode to give you an alert. Um, if any of you have played video games uh, and, and you've held a controller that has a rumble pack that, that shakes when, when you're playing a game, that's what vibrotactile is. It's a way of providing feedback using vibration instead of uh, through audio or um, by engaging the hands. Um, the reason we did this is because when we started looking at assistive technologies that were available for traveling, uh, what we found was that a lot of these technologies were being abandoned, primarily because these technologies were interfering with the person's hands or the person's hearing, right? So uh, one of the things we heard from mobility instructors was that initially uh, a lot of visually impaired uh, travelers really liked um, some apps or some devices that talk a lot, but then they start missing environmental cues, ambient sounds. So they'll miss that there's an air conditioner unit or something that can help them locate themselves. So um, we started looking at a different way of communicating, and that was just using uh, vibration instead. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, it's, it's quickly learned it's vibration to the body, so you know if it's happening on the left of your body or the right of your body, so it gives you some spatial orientation. And it's also discrete, which is something else we heard. Um, the fact that uh, the iPhone has great accessibility, but everyone is hearing while you're navigating your phone. So one of the things we heard was um, that people on the street or on the subway are also hearing all their messages on, on your phone when it's speaking out, unless you have an earbud on. So um, that's why we decided to explore vibrotactile. Um, so we wanted to complement the cane. And uh, in what we thought the cane was doing, and, and for, uh, for, for most people, was helping them avoid obstacles, right? Um, you, uh, the way the cane is used is move left to right. And if there's a hole or there's something in the way, then you're aware of it. You can navigate around it. 
Um, but as we started talking to more and more people, we also realized that the cane is also used as an exploration device, um, which was a, a, a new concept for us to understand. Um, but here I have two pictures, and for those of you that can't see it, I'll describe them. On the left, I have a picture that I took um, about two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., um, and it's a corner of, a, of an intersection, and there's a light pole, but it has these really large um, metal signs really, really low, and they're coming out of that light pole. So your cane will go underneath that, but um, we're told these are called lollipop signs, right? Where uh, the cane doesn't tell you it's there, but you're going to bump into it. Um, Headhunters. Head okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, right. And on the right, I have a second um, example of that, which is a sidewalk. Um, there's a fence to the right of it. This, the, the grass is mowed very nicely. But as you go through, there's this large tree with limbs and, and, uh, and leaves coming over that fence, hanging above. And it's right at chest and face level. Um, so these are overhangs that you would encounter just traveling in your neighborhood as you're getting around. And, and we were told that these are the stressful situations that people encounter in their day-to-day -day travel. Um, yes? Yes, steps, steps are also um, uh, another issue. Um, so when we started doing research and we started trying to put together some of the technologies that we use, we do a lot of uh, camera processing, kind of like house work where we can recognize gestures. But those things are, are limited in, in the number of gestures or the number of situations you can use. In the real world, you just have every possible type of uh, scenario. So we looked at much simpler sensors, and we started trying to design a shirt or a vest that had some sensors that could detect things in the way before you reach them. And they would vibrate uh, your, your body when, when you're getting close to them. So you would have an alert that there's something coming up before you even uh, were physically close to it. Um, but when we started testing some of these shirts, um, we realized it was very difficult to um, to test because uh, everyone had, has different sizes. Um, the vibration has to be close to the skin. It, it was just a very difficult uh, uh, design to, to make work. And also then there's the aesthetic. Nobody wants to wear the same shirt or vest every day, right? So, so it just kind of didn't make sense. Um, so we moved to a modular design. We said, OK, can we take the concept of the sensor and the vibration, just make it a small little unit that you can clip on to your clothes or or your jacket. Um, so on the left, there are two images of some prototypes of a shirt and, and an uh, arm sleeve that have integrated sensors. That didn't really pan out too well. And on the right, we have a variety of uh, modular sensors, which are meant to be strapped onto the arms or, or uh, the wrist. And they contain a sensor that can detect uh, an object a meter and a half away and the device begins to vibrate stronger and stronger the closer you get to that object. Um, so these are uh, some of the earlier prototypes uh, of what we did. Um, now here's uh, some images of our newest design. Um, after we've uh, worked out a couple of uh, some of the technical details on the device, we hired a designer to make a, a much nicer case. Our initial cases were all boxes. And the designer, when he saw them, said he could tell that this was designed by engineers because there was just <laughs> boxes, right? Um, so, so the device now looks kind of like a little, like a little badge. Um, and it's very smooth. It doesn't have sharp corners to it. Um, and I have one right here, which I'll turn on. And you might not hear. I'm going to try to put it close to the microphone. But when something gets close to it, it begins to vibrate stronger. Okay, and as I move it away, it doesn't vibrate as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from far to close, I, so the microphone really isn't picking it up. Yeah. So when when things are too close, it vibrates slower. Yes. Yes. So. Um, 
the, the two other uh, images that I have besides the, the device, which uh, will be, we'll have an exhibitor table where you can come try it out. Um, we have a picture where it's clipped onto the shirt pocket, um, so it, it can sense things ahead of you and, and vibrate uh, ne next to your uh, chest. Or we also have sleeves that we can put on the arm, kind of like uh, armbands where you would carry an iPod, um, and you can just clip the device there. <laughs> Um, so right now we've actually um, created 10 of these prototypes and uh, five of them are already, uh, as of two weeks ago, are being tested uh, out, at, outside in the real world by uh, both uh, visually impaired and blind users. And we're already starting to get a lot of feedback about um, where they think it's best and some of the best scenarios. Uh, because initially we thought, okay, we were going to deal with this overhang problem, but it turns out that there's other situations where the device is actually maybe more useful. So we're trying to compile as much data as we can um, to figure out what the, what the actual uh, benefit is and um, what the common theme across all the scenarios is. Um, another thing about the device, um, it has a Bluetooth chip in it, so it connects to your smartphone. The reason for that is the smartphone can tell you uh, how much battery is left on it, um, and it can also help you locate it um, if you like lose it between the cushions on the couch. Um, it'll ping and, and let you know that you're getting closer to it. Um, you can also change the intensity. If it's vibrating too fast for you or not strong enough for you, then you can also change those levels with the smartphone app. Um, and another thing that we can do with this, which Y will uh, touch on uh, in his projects, is that we don't necessarily have to just use the sensor on the device, but the vibration can also be um, another signal, uh, another output device besides just uh, talking. So for example, with um, GPS applications on your smartphone, um, they tell you to turn left, turn right at different intersections, and they're speaking out, right? Uh, but maybe they speak out too much. So if you're wearing the device on either arm, then it can just buzz you on the left to tell you that it's time to turn left without having to uh, speak out. And again, that goes to the discreteness. Um, other people are not aware that you're using it. And uh, yes? Question. Yes. So the deaf community is another, uh, is another one we'll start to look at um, because, yeah, vibration is a, is a way of them communicating and receiving alerts and communications. Also yeah. blind as well. Right, right. Um, those are all the kinds of things we're, we're hoping to expand into. And right now we, we have it in testing with people and we're trying to produce as many as we can to get as much feedback as possible. Um, yeah, thank you. That's uh, all for me. Yes? Can I ask one question? Sure. Is there any way that the device can alert you to um, what, if something is overhead, or if you can, you know, steps? Because otherwise you're just going to know something's coming, but you have no idea what, what's coming. Right. So, so the way it works is it will tell you that it's coming directly in front of the sensor. So if you're wearing it on your shirt, you'll know that it's, that it's something at chest level. Or, or at head level. So it would not be a, uh, steps in that scenario. Well, if um, steps, how mm -hmm. would it alert? So, so there is something that has, so steps have come up a lot in, in our testing, right? And everyone says, why don't we just strap this to the bottom of the cane, right? Have it sense at the bottom of the cane so we can detect when the steps are coming, uh, coming ahead. And so that's something we'll try. Um, but mobility instructors have also told us that that We'll have to test that because if we start vibrating the cane, then that might interfere with some of the natural vibration of s concrete surfaces and tile surfaces. So we, we need to be careful how we change the property of the cane by vibrating it. Yes. yes. All right, thanks, Akara. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Waiku. Um, I'm a PhD student at the uh, City College Visual Computing Lab. And the topic for my part of the presentation is about leveraging games and virtual reality for better assistive technologies. Uh, so 
why games and uh, virtual realities? Well, uh, on the uh, purely technical and research side of it, uh, it allows us for a quick prototyping of uh, an environment we could virtualize, let's say, this particular floor, the, the 14 conference center, and we, it also allows us to simulate different assistive technology. It could be emerging new technology, it could be something that has been out for a while, and furthermore, allow us to uh, conduct more experimental and uh, controlled uh, research uh, experiments. So for, for example, think of uh, doing an EEG study while you're performing some sort of navigation task, right? In the traditional sense, you can't really strap probes on your brain while you walk around the building. The probe doesn't go that far. But here, the, in the virtual reality part, we can sort of cut that wire, so to speak, and allow us to do this kind of study. Um, games and virtual reality also allow us for uh, a unified benchmarking. So we, it, it could uh, allow us to do some sort of testing that tell us, well, how well is this uh, uh, technology doing? Uh, how well is the user adapting to it or adapt to it? Uh, does the user like it? Is it easy to use? That kind of questions. Um, the benchmarking we could kind of conceptualize as, uh, as a game scoring mechanism. I'm sure some of you play some games on your phone and you're eager to score the next higher point and the next higher point. So we could have something similar to this where you have point uh, scoring system in, in the uh, game and virtual reality and uh, we using the point score to tell us, well, this is doing quite well for uh, so-and-so user and well, how is it compared to the other user using the same technology? Uh, in addition to uh, using it as a benchmarking tool, we could also use uh, games and virtual reality, like how was saying, as a training tool and a simulation tool. Uh, so a new technology comes out, uh, they need to get training on it. Well, we could just put in on the virtual reality and let them play with it for a while, get used to the device, and then go out to the real world and try it out. Um, and last but not least, it's very fun to play. So our, our main focus uh, for the project is for navigation and, and visual impairment, but of course this can be extended to other, other tasks. Uh, it could be extended to other groups of people as well. Um, my particular research topic is evaluation of it. So we, I want to study, uh, can we compare one technology to the next? Uh, can we see if certain user prefer certain uh, feature in the technology or not? Um, we also want to uh, study the multimodal interaction. So what kind of input does the user prefer and what kind of output? By, by input, I meant uh, would infrared sensor be better, would sonar sensor be better, or would regular camera be better? And by output devices, I meant should it be a haptic device, should it be an audio, should it be some sort of electro or something else. So there are many different uh, uh, projects that's going on in the lab. I'm gonna showcase two of them. Uh, the, the first one that you're seeing uh, now, it's called the Crowd Navigation. So in this project, it's basically there's a smartphone app and a, a blind user walking around with the with their phone and, and holding it sort of in front of the person and walking around and the camera will stream the view in front of you to a uh, online portal, and then you have a, a group of uh, so quote unquote volunteers that will give you direction how to go from point A to point B. All right, so for uh, initial testing purposes, we're only using left, right, forward, and stop. I know it's very discreet, and they, 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 they may, some users may prefer more continuous uh, uh, turn, but for testing purposes, that's what we have so far. So where does game and virtuality come into this? Well, you don't want to send a real user onto uh, 23rd Street and have them walk around and tell them to go left and right. Uh, that could be dangerous. So we virtualize a, a maze and then stream that uh, virtual maze to the uh, online portal and then the group of volunteers give direction to either the avatar or to another user who's controlling the avatar. All right, and, and we, we are testing different ways of communicating all these information to the user because we have um, a group of, let's say, 10 volunteers. They all give you some direction. Some could say left, some could say right. 
but they're not all going to be transmitted to the to run user. It will be aggregated into a single response to the user. So we're testing different way uh, of transmitting that. And of course, for feedback purposes, we are using text-to-speech, but we could also use the Vista devices for vibration uh, if, we, if we wanted to. Uh, yeah, so that's the crowd navigation. The next one is specifically about the Vista devices. So while the company Vista Variable is developing the physical devices, we can begin to explore questions like, where, where should we put these devices? And, and what kind of input sensor should we use, as I mentioned before? Uh, should it be infrared or sonar? Or could, it could be a combination of both. And what kind of feedback mechanism, haptic or sound? Or it could be both, right? So at the moment, we simulated the eighth floor in uh, City College in the NAC building as a uh, virtual environment. We, we strap on, virtualize a uh, infrared and sonar sensor, so three infrared on your left and right arms and a sonar sensor on your chest pointing front. And we also uh, virtualize some uh, ambient sound, like the elevator sound, uh, footsteps. And uh, in the physical uh, part of it, so the, the user will be sitting in front of the computer with the vibrator attached to the corresponding location in, on their arm, left and right. And then using the vibration, they navigate around the, the environment from starting point to a destination that we have specified. And then they, they could use the uh, stereo headphone to listen to the sound because uh, the, the sound in, in the uh, virtual reality is, is spatialized. So you can tell whether it's left or right and how far is it from the front or back. Uh, so some future vision of the uh, uh, games and in, in, in virtual reality for, for these projects. We, we want to eventually build like uh, online services. So deploy these games online. And let's say you got a device from a Vista variable and you, you bring it home. You can play around with it in your living room, or you can connect to these uh, online uh, game and, and play with the virtual environment. Uh, let's say the environment loaded uh, this floor building, and, it, and so you can walk around this building virtually, online at home. Um, if enough users are playing this game online, we could collect more data from each user, and then we'll be able to answer the question like, is this technology useful? Uh, is it easy to use? Does someone like it? Does someone not like it? Does someone prefer it uh, differently than the default configuration? And we could also integrate um, other hardware into the game for more intuitive uh, control. So there's new uh, uh, devices that's coming out. I'm sure some of you have heard of Oculus Rift. Uh, so it's a good hat, hat tracker device that we could use in addition to uh, use as a, as a visual display. Um, there's also a, uh, a omnidirectional treadmill, which is uh, founded by a, a Kickstarter company called Vir Virtuax. The, they're still developing the treadmill, but basically imagine a circular platform that you could walk on any direction you want how fast you want, and it will be translated into the uh, virtual reality. So it will be as if you are navigating a real environment at home, standing sort of in place. All right, so thanks for presenting, and any questions you may have?